feel very good. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you.
from the users, right? It's usually faster, but gives, you know. <laughs> And the password is wrong. Anyway, so the thing I'm working on are called in-browser remote consoles, which are surprisingly kind of desktop remote consoles, but in the browser. Such a surprise. Uh, if you want to look at it from a browser, it looks like this. Here is a Slugbox session running in an HTML5 canvas in Firefox. Uh, we have it something like this. So we have a summary screen of a VM. Uh, where you can hit a button to access the VM console, it opens a pop-up from where you can click in the VM and you can administer it. If you're a sysadmin, you probably appreciate stuff like that. Uh, the architecture looks like this. You have your browser, you have your VM. The VM runs on a hypervisor or a host machine, which provides you a VNC or another uh, remote desktop session. Uh, your browser doesn't really speak this language. The closest thing to VNC, which is streaming bidirectionally, is called WebSockets. The browser also can do HTTP, but it's useless for this. So you need something in the middle that will translate, transmit between the two. For now, let's call it the proxy. So we we'll look at the proxy from closer, a little more closer. You realize that the proxy consists of scary stuff like I.O. and rec and sockets, blocking uh, input and output and those things, threads. We're going to talk about all of those. So if you look at it under another aspect of the proxy, you have the two endpoints, WebSocket and VNC. And you want to read from the WebSocket and write to the VNC, and read from the VNC and write to the WebSocket, and translate between the two languages. If I talk about endpoint, what I mean about endpoints, uh, let's uncover them together. These are sockets. I did this talk in Australia and some of the people didn't get it. So, socket is a universal language for networking. In Ruby, you can use it like this. Here I'm opening a uh, connection to the website of the conference through HTTP. I send some headers and requests. Uh, then I have the response headers and the payload. Here they are sending me to an HTTPS site because I'm doing HTTP. Uh, that's good actually. You need to use everything securely. And if you look at the methods, what I'm using, read, write, what uh, other objects in computer science come into your mind? File. Yes, files. So sockets are basically files for networking. Uh, when you run a write to a socket, you actually write to a buffer, uh, which will be uploaded to the network card. So let's write some data. And when the network card has enough CPU time or network access, it will, the operating system will form packets and send it to the network. Uh, this operation is a whole, it's atomic if you just read write, uh, just, you just call write. So if there is no space in the buffer, it will wait, it will block. So this is why it's called blocking write. For reading, I was lazy to do the slides, so you have to use your imagination, but you can get the point. If there is a buffer, you read from the buffer, whereas when it's no data in the buffer, you just wait until there will be something, and you block in the meantime. So if you want to write a proxy using these, you want to do something like that. Because of the blocking read and write, you need to do threads to have them uh, handled separately, together. You have an handle snoop, you read from socket A, translate into the language of socket B, and write into that. And in the same direction, reading from socket B, translating, uh, writing to socket A. Makes sense, right? Don't do that. This is wrong because Ruby doesn't really use well threads. So there is a thing called the global interpreter lock, which doesn't allow you to run more, uh, more than one thread at the same time, uh, which it's kind of okay if you use I.O. because uh, usually you wait for the network and in the meantime another thread can run. However, the threads are expanded. So if you have like 500 connections in proxy, you need 1,000 threads. That's not cheap in any other any language. So there is a solution for that called non-blocking I.O. Uh, in Ruby, it's implemented in a way that you just add a non-block suffix to the read and write calls. Uh, the methods aren't waiting. 
So you don't test the buffer, you just try to write to it or try to read from the buffer. And if uh, the buffer is not empty or full, depending on the context, it just fails. So you don't block. You can do, do more calls at the same time. And you can use a single loop for, for handling a lot of connections at the same time. Testing the readiness is extracted out to a separate call. In most of the operating systems, is implemented as IO select, where you pass uh, one, two, three, four, or three arguments an array of reads or an array of writes or an array of errors, sockets, arrays, to test, and an optional timeout which tells the operating system how long, how patient the operating system should be. One second, ten second, or just wait infinitely. Uh, this is really cool if you want to have like ten multiple connections. So you can have something like this. It's just reading from the uh, network, it's reading from multiple sockets, you can push them, register the new sockets, and here is the line that's responsible for selecting the ready sockets. So the to read array will have only sockets that are ready, and you can iterate through them and write to the screen. Does it make sense? Okay. So, there is a problem with this, and there are dependencies. When you want to write, uh, read from A and write to B, both the readiness of A to read and the readiness of B to write should be ready. So it's not enough to wait for one thing in sockets, you have to wait for at least two. One read and one write. And the two things should be paired. So you want to do something like that. You have a pairing where you pair your socket A with socket B and you want a method to translate. Yeah, that's my case. In other cases you might not need it. And you do an IO select for both read and write and iterate through all the re uh, reads and if the write part of the read isn't ready you jump up, out from the socket, from the loop. Problem with this is when you have socket A only ready for reading and nothing else for writing. In this case, the IO select will return uh, in the first array, it will return socket A and the write array will be an empty and when you iterate through the reads array, it will jump to the next and jump out from the loop because the reads, the writes array isn't, isn't containing socket B. So when you call again the loop, the IO select, it will return again to you socket A for reading, reading to be ready. Uh, you jump into the iteration and you hit the next. So if you think about this through, it will hit you an endless loop and it eats up 100% of your CPU. This is really bad. We use this code in production for two years. Uh, I was looking into some alternative solutions. One of them was quitting my job, of course, doing something else. Uh, I was also thinking about not using Ruby, but we run in an environment where all the stuff should be written in Ruby because we have some copy and write working craziness around it. Uh, using threads is a no-go because uh, if you have 1,000 connections, you need 2,000. Okay, I had the first example of 500, but you get it. Uh, there are some libraries for asynchronous I.O. Uh, Teddy will talk about one of them. Uh, celluloid and the band machine are no-go because our environment uses Postgres in an async manner, so we couldn't use it. Async is a cool thing. It's a really nice library. You should use it. I should have used it, but at that time it didn't exist. If I would write the code now, I would just use this library and uh, this talk wouldn't exist, be existing. Uh, or you can also wait for all the fibers to happen. Fibers you will hear in the next talk. They are really cool. They are basically lightweight threads, really cheap threads, where you control when they are running, you can schedule them. And when you wait for something, they yield. So they give back, give you back into the context. Uh, you should imagine something like this. So you have a fibers array at the top, and the loop at the bottom, which runs these fibers. And when you do the read and write, they are blocking the calls. Uh, they will jump out from the fiber and call the second one. So it basically schedules you, it does some magic to make your blocking code non-blocking in the Ruby level. Problem with this is that they aren't in Ruby 2, and they will probably come in Ruby 3 and we don't have them that much time. So we came up with an idea of bouncing select, which is a few lines of addition to the original code. Just mark them, I will give you some time. 
So the idea here is that we that I created dynamic arrays for the sockets, uh, as you see to read and to write. And after the I/O select, I remove the ready sockets from these dynamic arrays, and uh, on the next loop they aren't selected again. Which means if socket A is ready for reading but socket B isn't ready for writing. Uh, after the select, it gets removed from the to read array, it goes through the iteration, and that next IO select will not call uh, socket with socket A because uh, it was already removed from the array. And after, if you do a successful transition transmission, you just put back the, two, uh, the sockets into the to read and to write. This basically bridges through the problem of, uh, of having this bill. Oh, I see scared face. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's still not ideal because IO select is slow. If you have 500 sockets, I will just use this number all the time. If you have 500 sockets, you need to copy all the socket descriptors to the kernel, and then the kernel will call the waiting. So it takes some time to run it. If you have a lot of lots of sockets, it scales bad. So uh, the kernel developers, of the Linux kernel, came up with an idea called ePoll, which is much higher performance. They split up the whole waiting and registering part. So you have a method for uh, registering the socket first, sending into the kernel, keeping it there in the memory, and you have a separate method for the waiting process. So you don't have to send the sockets all the time you want to wait. So register and wait. It's also, uh, the only problem with this, it's available only in Linux. For ATSD people also implemented uh, KQ, which is a little similar. It can, it's also available on Mac. But my solution for now is just to fall back to IO select. Uh, also, it does something for us for free. So there is a flag called equal one shot, and you can register a socket with this flag. And after uh, calling a wait, this removes the socket from the internal structure, which means it does the first uh, removing the bounce out part for us for free. So we don't have to do that. Uh, yeah, and then you have to rearm it, of course. So in C code, the EPO looks something like this. So you need to register the socket. Here we have the EPO control, EPO control add, uh, the socket pointer from Ruby, and then, uh, above that you see the flags. And the select call is it's just the EPO wait call on the descriptor. Let's say we iterate to 256 events. And we go through these events and set the readiness in the Ruby structure. And afterwards, we can do the proxying because you will have the readiness set up. It's a C extension in Ruby. Works well on Linux. For any other platform, use IO select. We use only Linux for running manage IQ. But feel free to create a pull request with KQ if you want to support uh, FreeBSD or Mac. So the second part of the talk is about WebSockets. Does anyone know what web sockets are? Child. Child. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, web sockets are basically abusing, I missed two letters from the beginning, abusing HTTP for bidirectional transfer. So you open an HTTP connection, but then you use it for bidirectional transfer. You basically lie to the server what you want to do. So, you have your browser on the web server, you send a request, get WebSocket HTTP 1.1, uh, you send a connection upgrade, upgrade WebSocket headers, the server sends you back, yeah, I understand you, you can send me WebSockets, and after these two headers, the connection will swi switch to uh, the RFC, which defines WebSockets, and it will be bidirectional. And my, the previous speaker was talking about REC, right? Uh, if you think about it, how, uh, WebSockets could be implemented in the rack when the whole thing is a function call. Just let, let's repeat the stuff so you will see the same stuff you already see. So here is a simple rack function, a rack example, I think the same as uh, we had previously. I copied from the same website. Uh, you need uh, something that responds to the call method. Uh, let's say a lambda or a class with a call method, doesn't really matter. And you return with the free stuff, the number of the status, the headers in an array, or hash, sorry, and an array of strings and the response. Uh, this thing doesn't really handle well. Yeah, and also, you can basically, uh, it's, it's a really good thing that all the requests are handled as a function, so you can say it's a function of the server, 
but you know. So this thing is really good for like request response protocols, but it doesn't really handle well a streaming connection because imagine standing at, at the here you do some stuff part and block your whole rack handler for like an hour because you have an hour long web socket connection. Your Puma server will just die. So uh, there is a solution for that called socket hijacking. It's basically asking the web server to give you the socket connection under the uh, uh, the socket descriptor, uh, the underlying request connection, so you can do your stuff with it. In practice, it looks like this. So you have a, in the end hash, you have a rec hijack object, and you, if you call this, the web server will return, return you the socket, and this is the socket to your web socket, incoming web socket connection. So if you read something from there, you will see web sockets. If you write something for, uh, to there, which is not a web socket, your client will just crash. Uh, then, in our uh, case, we have an address and port, which is the remote endpoint to a VNC server. Let's call it, uh, let's retrieve it using the magic function and open the connection. And then we push this to a proxy, which runs in a separate thread, but, uh, and run it with thread. So if an incoming request comes, we hijack the socket, we return something, and the next request can be served. So the whole thing is offloaded to that proxy. And this is what uh, Rec Hijack does. This is how we roll with our stuff. So we have our browser with the proxy and the VM, and you can do remote consoles in Manage IQ. Uh, while I was looking into this, I started playing with the HTTP upgrade and the Rec Hijack. So if you have your upgrade request, started thinking, what if we would not upgrade to WebSocket, but upgrade to GATS, for example? Whatever protocol you want here. Uh, will it work? It will. So my crazy mind started uh, having ideas that I can do stuff which uh, was uh, not possible before. So instead of this architecture uh, with the browser, I was imagining something like this. So instead of the browser, you could use a VNC client to connect to, an H to a proxy, which opens an HTTP connection, which will be changed to something else in the meantime, and use a native desktop client for, for opening a VNC session through this whole uh, web server thing. So you would ask me why would I do something like this, because it's totally complicated and crazy. And the answer is in, in this long time fight. So Things in the browser, at least with HTML5 canvas, are slow. So if you want to render a whole Windows or Linux desktop in your browser uh, window in the canvas, it will be never be that slow if you would have like a desktop VNC client. Also, you don't have stuff like clipboards, you don't have stuff like key mapping, and this is something our customers wanted. So going back to think this, uh, as you know, in computer science, there are two hard problems, cache invalidation and naming things. So I came up with this idea, let's call it Burr. My awesome colleague also drew a logo for this, which is cute. Uh, and you probably guessed it stands for Protocol Upgrade Raw Request, uh, which is basically HTTP upgrade, then you switch to VNC, or you switch to SSH because you don't want to use a browser-based terminal but your own favorite extern, let's say, or whatever protocol you want, VNC, D DNS, whatever. So it's basically TCP smuggled through HTTP. Because it's not tunneled after the HTTP handshake, it becomes that protocol. And in our uh, architecture, we would like to have something like this. So we have a virtualized environment with Overt. Manage IQ manages it. And from the browser, we would like to access the VM. So we click on a native console button, which isn't there yet, but I hope it will be in a few weeks. So you click this button, and the browser sends a request to the server. It's not standardized yet, so I'm just using gibberish. So I'm sending the per request, and the server sends back some response with a URL, which triggers the browser plugin, because you cannot listen to a server from a, from a browser. A plugin can. So it triggers a plugin, and the plugin uh, opens a connection. It starts listening on a web server on localhost 1234 and it displays on a pop-up 
then please point your uh, favorite client to local plus one two three four. It's a total random port, so if you see the demo, it will not be one two three four. Don't get confused. Uh, so then you take your favorite client and connect it to uh, local plus one two three four, which triggers the plugin, which opens an HTTP upgrade request to the web server, which per as the pro protocol. Uh, which is actually routed to the proxy because it's a Rails application, so it's just a Rails route that says that they use the proxy if it's per. Uh, the proxy sends back an HTTP 101, which is the other part of the HTTP handshake, and then the protocol changes to, in this case, per, but it's actually VNC. The proxy opens a VNC connection to the hypervisor using the magic function I showed before, and through this blue line, you have a tunnel through an HTTP connection to the VM. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> so, this thing wasn't really true. So, I lied about the browser plugin. A browser plugin cannot listen to a TCP port. So, we have to do this hack. Browser plugin can actually run the binary. So if you have a native binary and you have the right credentials and some right setup, the browser can actually execute it, the plugin can actually execute it, uh, and you can listen to a port. It's a little crazy, I don't want to, want to go into more. If you Google native extensions and native communications uh, for browser plugins, you can find it. So I have a, this kind of architecture, or architecture. So we talked about the server which is the red part of this uh, thing. There is a plugin that basically calls a binary. There's a client proxy, which is the binary. And I'm still missing a front end library that actually calls the plugin and has the fancy UI and tells, tells the user to what port to use and things like that. Uh, the server looks like this. It's really similar to Rack. You basically just have a block where you have your magic function getting you the host of the port. You, you return the host of the port and your things get smuggled there. Doesn't matter what protocol you want to use, until it's TCP based, it will work. This whole thing behaves like HTTP. So we have URLs, you have Rails routing, you have loggers, authentication, cookies. You can use custom headers to determine the endpoint, whatever you want to use. Uh, you can use HTTPS around it so you can make it secure. And for now, it needs both the browser plugin and the binary. But actually, there is a W3C standard for uh, having this whole thing in a browser. So uh, the browser will be able, in a few years, to ask for a permission to open a TCP port on your computer. I'm looking forward to that, because then we can drop all the plugin part. It's really far from being production ready, but it works. And I have a demo. So I think I need to tell you the, that we are using TeamViewer now. Yes. <laughs> Just for the streaming. Okay. I will try to use it with one hand. Oh, ignore this, please. <laughs> Here is the Vigrant. Ah, this one. I missed this. Yeah. Sorry, I never used the Weaver in my life. <laughs> uh, I'm just plugging through everything to VNC, you know. Uh, so, uh, here is the Vigrant container I talked about. It's already built. It was building during my talk. That's, what, that's why it was so long, because I was downloading everything from the internet in the meantime. So I will show you the Vagrant file. If you, would know, if you don't know, Vagrant is a way to automate it, uh, for automated provisioning stuff. You write a script and it runs you a VM somewhere. In this case, in my local environment. So I have a one CPU, four gigs of RAM, with a CentOS VM. I install Docker. I install uh, software collections, which gives me Ruby. Uh, I run Docker. I pull two containers. One of them is CentOS XFCF VNC, which is a desktop environment on a VNC server in a container. And also I pull an SSH server. 
These are both running in Docker containers. And if you know Docker, if you don't expose ports in your Docker environment, you cannot access the stuff locally. So I'm not doing that. So if you think about it, I have a VM that runs two containers. And the VM is accessible from my machine, but the two containers aren't. And I'm trying to access those two containers through a server, which is also running on the VM. It's, uh, it will be running on this server, that SH, which I will show you now. Uh, yeah. So it basically runs Puma with the per root file, which is a REC application, which is super simple. I have a logger and the static files of the server. Uh, I have a really simple router, not as cool as anyone was showing you. So if the request URL is uh, VNC, then redirect the per uh, server to VNC server and this port, and SSH then redirect to SSH server and this port. Those are in the ATC host files of the VM automatically from this Wagon file. Here are these two lines. And I have an index.html which renders you a, a dummy website with per demo with two buttons. And as I don't have a front-end library, I need to use uh, event listeners to communicate with the plugin. So I send custom events with uh, opening the URL and exiting it later. So let's see this in action. I cannot really do it with one hand, sorry. So the server is running, I highlighted the address. I, got, I don't have a pop-up yet, a magic pop-up, but I have a local host and a port. If I try to open it, I have a VNC client here. And just paste the address in the port. Here we go. This is a VNC session that goes through an HTTP, HTTP server. And if you will think that the performance is, of this thing is slow, that it will not work like ever, uh, I, will have, I can show you. sound, I'm sorry for that, but I don't think there is a performance issue here. Also, let's try SSH. I have another connection. Uh, I tried to run SSH to this port, wrong port, sorry. I accept the keys. I am I'm on that machine. And if you would tell me that I'm just making up this whole stuff, let's try to SSH to the machine. Yeah. It's hard to type with one hand. So, please work. Yeah. So, ping VNC server. It works from here. If we are in the uh, VM. But if I try to connect, to the container from here, it doesn't. Also, if I click here on the stop button, I will get the error from the VNC connection. The connection is closed, and my SSH is also closed. So getting back to the slides, I think it's all. Thank you very much. and. I have those two stickers with me. I would like one with Pearl. <laughs> questions? So, uh, questions so far? Gets rid of this live proxy we have in the browser. 
what if we like uh, connect VNC directly to the server proxy they have? Well, you mean the HTTP header exchange first, so it will not work. And it's easier to write a proxy than to change all the VNC clients in the world. But we can open like open a new port on the server. Yeah, so uh, explain to security guys that you want to open a new port. I think you got the message. <laughs> I give stickers for questions. Uh, I actually have a quick question. Did you think about using Atom to build some kind of client for, like, client application for your customers? Uh, uh, I have a VPN server which no one on Earth can block for now because it camouflages itself as HTTP. Does it answer your question? In a way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I also want a uh, speaker. Uh, so, uh, you use uh, the Rack Hijack interface and uh, I just want to ask you how happy you are with this. <laughs> With the rack right hijack? Yeah. Well, even if it's written dirtily, it's awesome. So, uh, it's like a trade off that you want to use something bad for something good. Okay. Like, uh, the way you can see, uh, not spice. Uh, VNC was easier to explain. We also use spice. I mean, it's a uh, Red Hat Inventions, as far as I know. Uh, it also can do like USB ports from the client and uh, if you have a browser based Spice you lose all this functionality but it also works with Spice, yes. Uh, second question, uh, why not use just a native client uh, to connect to the proxy? Uh, well, the proxy uh, uh, it's, it's running behind the HTTP so it will expect an HTTP request so the native client doesn't know what to do with it. And uh, as I was explaining to Dima, we didn't want to open a new port on the server. So we only have one port open on the server, it's 443 for HTTPS, and it's so uh, hard security to think that we cannot break. Uh, next question. Uh, there will be a moment when Mobit will be packaged for Debian. Uh, yeah, I hope so. So now, please. Excuse me? Uh, no? Never? No, no. uh, I, I really need to look into how RPMs are made. Uh, I'm a Red Hat employee and I don't know. Shame on me. But if I learn how to do it, you will have it. Promise. And uh, this is the last question. Might be slightly off topic. Uh, how is life after ABM for shift car? I cannot comment on that. I'm sorry. There is a question. Uh, so how about security? I mean, do you have logs? I do. <laughs> Every, everything, do you log everything? Uh, uh, log? What do you mean by this? I mean, you trans uh, transfer a lot of data, right? Do you log anything like that? Can you, can you speak a little louder? Uh, do you log any thing tab that you actually transfer from one endpoint to another? I'm not sending any packets if you think like that, but the VNC can have passwords, and you have a long URL token if you want. I mean, here I was using, uh, where is it? So here I was using the long, short URL for two servers. But imagine a situation where you dynamically create a ticket to uh, one client with a 64 character long thing in the URL, or in a, in a hidden header, so only that client can access it. I need the second sticker, one for me, one for my wife. Um, I think Stas was asking, uh, are you able to uh, hijack password of the VNC session? Uh, Is it like encrypted protocol or 
can we log it and uh, like trace the password in the data of the VNC connection? Honestly, I, I don't know and I don't care what protocol the customer uses. Okay, that's it's not important, right? <laughs> so, uh, for real, uh, I don't know how VNC, how much VNC encrypts the password, but ideally we don't want to have a password there because we have the long ticket and only the sysadmin could see where it's connecting or and the client. So you open the VNC server without a password anyway? Yeah, with the token <laughs> and a long URL. So, networking dummy question. So, you showed off uh, great performance. Is uh, using HTTPS instead of HTTP uh, impacts that in any way? Not in the demo, but we use HTTPS in production. Okay. Uh, is HTTP2 any help? It's uh, quite a danger. Well, that time HTTP2 wasn't that cool. I mean, two years ago, uh, I don't think any servers were like running it properly. Uh, there is no difference. So HTTP2 works very similarly, and if you upgrade and you use HTTP2 for streaming, it's the, it's the same as you would use WebSocket. So into that upgrade header, where are you? Into that upgrade header. Yeah, here you can write anything, and if you want to upgrade to HTTP2, if you do an HTTP2 request, you also write your H2 or something like that. So HTTP2 uses a very similar approach. Okay, thanks. There is one more. Sorry. How much traffic does it generate on the server side and on the client side? If I have a slow connection from like 3G, could I use it? I mean, it's the same So I'll just see a slideshow on, on the client side. It's the same performance as we have seen. So I mean, it can be the same or the reverse. Sorry, but I didn't get you. What about permissions on the server? Yeah, on so the I actually told So uh, if you have like a long URL dynamically generated for this. Thing. So here we have like short URLs and very specific. But imagine that when you click on that button that you want a native console, you actually create a ticket on the server with a random hash, which will be part of the URL. And imagine this whole end request you are writing dynamic. That if uh, you look into the database and if it's there, you will get the host and the port. Does it make you feel it's more secure? I mean, you need to uh, like find those 64 character long hash or whatever long it is. No. No? Maybe uh, some sleep, uh, maybe some uh, can listen to uh, your uh, HTTP request. It's HTTPS. HTTPS, okay. Okay, in this demo it was HTTP because I was lazy, but you got a point.